Good afternoon and welcome to this quarter's Union Hospital Town Hall meetings. I'm Darwin Smith, Vice President of Human Resources. I'm joined today by Bruce James, our President and CEO. And as you know, we always start every meeting with an eye care standard. This month we're starting with A for accountability. Take responsibility for my decisions, actions, and performance. Solve a problem or take care of a situation rather than waiting for someone else to handle it. And I represent Union Hospital to everyone with whom I interact. So as you go through the rest of your day today, think about what accountability means to you and your job. To me, it means that you've taken the opportunity to learn more about Union Hospital and the direction in which we are going. We'll start with our quality pillar, and our first slide shows our LeapFrog Group Hospital Safety Score of A. LeapFrog, if you're not familiar with that group, is a national nonprofit organization which was created to help through a sense of transparency to score hospitals across the country and then provide that information to back to people. And we scored a score of A this quarter and I congratulate you as employees to help us to achieve that score of A to provide a better environment for our patients as well as our employees. In recognition, we have the Union Hospital Stroke Program which achieved a Gold Plus status. Gold Plus is the highest award that you can achieve uh, within this certification. Uh, it's given to us by the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association. You may recall that a few years ago we started to work with Cleveland Clinic to provide better stroke care for our patients to either keep them here at Union Hospital or appropriately transfer them to a better facility to care for them. Hospital acquired infections. You will notice our last four quarters of scores uh, on the chart. You'll notice to the right uh, there are two areas that we're concerned with. C. diff, which we had four C. diff cases in the third quarter, and in surgical site infections we had a large jump to 10 this quarter. Our goal obviously would be to be at zero for all of these uh, hospital acquired infections. We know that's not necessarily uh, possible to do, but we do want to reduce those and we'll talk about how we can do that as we go through the presentation. Process measures, you can see our goals in the left hand column for each of these areas. We're doing very well with these. The only one that we are above at this point in time is the time to EKG for AMIs and chest pain. Our goal is to have it less than 10 minutes and we're at 11.9. You'll notice that that is trending downward, however. You will also notice that influenza vaccines, there are two, uh, the last two quarters do not have any scores because we do not track those during the second and third quarters of the year. Hand hygiene, what I talked about, hospital acquired infections, one of the best things we can do is to ensure that we do have good hand hygiene. Our goal is 100% of hand hygiene, uh, whether you use soap and water or whether you use alcohol scrub. Uh, during the third quarter of 2015, we continued at the 93% completion on that. So we would ask that we continue to make sure, again, that our patients know that we're either washing our hands or using alcohol scrub. During the, the month of October, as you know, we had a paint tusk pink event. And uh, we started this a few years ago at Union Hospital. It's been picked up by Healthy Tusk and also several other organizations in, in the area as well. You will notice on the top of the hospital, if you noticed uh, during the month of October, we had a, about a 30-foot ribbon that was uh, created by Mike Jackson, our Director of Plant Operations and Maintenance. And uh, we hung it on top of the building. Unfortunately, the winds came along and, and blew it down, but it was up there for several weeks. You can also see that several other, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of other organizations in the area have picked up on the Paint Tusk Pink event. And you can see uh, some of the other area organizations that did pick up on that. So uh, we appreciate your assistance with that as well. Now, Mr. James, service pillar. Okay, thank you, Darwin. Uh, the first thing I want to go over the service pillar is the inpatient data or the HCAP scores. And actually the last quarter was very good for HCAPs. If you look over here we can see that the 9s and 10s, we were almost up to the 70th percentile. It's been one of the highest quarters we've ever had. All the other uh, areas showed an uh, increase. Communication with nurses and communication with doctors was uh, two very high ones. On this slide you'll see that the hospital environment took a, a spin up. 
Pain management, again, almost at one of our highest records, and at discharge instructions over here was the highest it's ever been. So we had some really, really good data coming out of that third quarter for the inpatient side. This last press gainy um, showing on the um, kind of a sawtooth there, and that actually is the inpatient questions that are not in the H caps. Those are ones like food service and things like that, and it even went up. However, Every time we have a good quarter on the inpatient side, it's a not so good quarter on the outpatient side. I can't get them to go the same direction the same quarter. So, as you look through the outpatient data, you'll see ED took a decline down, outpatient took a decline down. Now, one of the things I want to say when I say decline down, we're talking about percentile rank. This doesn't always mean that our scores are actually getting lower. The people are still kind of rating us about the same way. The problem is every hospital in the country is trying to do better on the patient experience data and we're being passed by some other people. So if we stay at the same place, our percentile rank drops. So in a lot of these cases, you'll see that our scores are not a lot different than they may have been two or three quarters ago, <clears throat> but we're a little bit further down in the rankings. Uh, first care also went down a little bit, but the one area in the outpatient that went up was ambulatory surgery, and this is the highest ambulatory surgery has seen since we started measuring them on press gaining. They're up at almost the 70th percentile, so good job for that group. In the growth pillar, we talk about numbers. Uh, this is the inpatient world, and as we all have talked about, the community hospitals, uh, the idea is to have less and less patients in an inpatient setting. We want people who are really, really sick to be inpatients, but a lot of people will say some of our lower level inpatients tend to be people who we failed in the system. They should have been taken care of either as a, in the doctor's office or in the outpatient setting. So we've seen those numbers go down, and, in, and, and if you look at this chart, you'll see it, but also if you look at this chart, the average daily census is sometimes an easier way to look at it. If you were here and working in 2010, on any given day we probably had 73 inpatients. This year on any given day we had about 56 inpatients. So there's about a 20% decline in there. And that is what we're seeing is a declining inpatients and an increasing outpatient. Uh, if you look at deliveries, that's the blue bar up there. Deliveries have stayed pretty constant. Every year since I've been here we've delivered right around 700 babies. Now the surgery was going down and we were a little bit concerned about that, but you can see the last three years have sort of plateaued off. The thing that we're thinking about that one is when the high deductible plans came in, we saw a lot of elective surgeries go away. We're beginning to see those elective surgeries come back now, so we're thinking that's stabilized a little bit. Uh, if you look on the next slide, you'll see ED visits and outpatient registrations. This is where our world is growing, and those numbers on the chart look a little bit flat. Uh, if you look here, the numbers over here are uh, the, the tail. We were, uh, through the first nine months last year, we had 183,000 outpatient visits. This year we've had 191,000, almost 10,000 more visits in nine months. Same sort of thing is happening over in the emergency department. Last year they were at a little over 32,000. This year they're at about 33,000, so about 1,000 more visits in the nine months. So while that data looks pretty flat, you're going to see it. Uh, continuing to increase and that's the reason we're building a new ED. Uh, it's, co it's coming along pretty well. If you can see here that the walls are up, uh, we probably will start seeing patients in there either late February, early March. Um, now that's going to be the top floor where the, where the patient care is going to be delivered. Once we get into that area, we will go back and renovate the waiting room. The area that's right now, the express, will become the triage area. And then we'll build an, uh, a canopy over so that people can drive uh, under and let their loved ones out at the emergency room. During that period, the registration and waiting room will be on the lower level. So by the time we get all of that finished, the project won't be completely done until sometime in probably July. But um, the emergency room is moving along real well. We also added a new uh, um, service line during this last quarter, and it's a long time since we've actually uh, added a new service line. One of the things is we begin to study the population and are, are being more and more responsible for taking care of people before they were in the hospital and after they leave the hospital. We're recognizing that there's a lot of social and behavioral needs that we're not addressing. So in September, we opened a behavioral health center. We offer two programs there. One is a partial hospitalization program, which is an intense program of a day hospital, basically, that you go five days a week and you're uh, kind of in a step-down situation from inpatient. The second program is an intensive outpatient program. It's three to four days a week. It has fewer services. You don't go quite as many hours on it, but it is also a step-down before you need to be going into just weekly or daily or monthly counseling. 
Uh, Dr. Couch is running the program for us. He is a psychiatrist out of um, Akron area. He's coming down here on a part-time basis, but we intend to grow the program, so you're also going to see us adding, uh, we're recruiting a couple of psychiatrists right now, so hopefully you'll see those in the next couple of years. This is just pictures of their uh, grand opening, um, and they're very proud of their space. If you want to go over and see it, for those of you who've been here for a while, I can tell you that it's the space that used to be the oncology office on the lower level before they moved to the upper level of the 300 building. We also are in the process of building a new building um, up on uh, North Worcester. Uh, this is across from Bueller's. If you're looking at that property from the Bueller's property, there's a building on the left-hand side that's going up. That's not us. That's the Novogratic building. They're an accounting firm. Our building will actually be a little bit on the right of the property and further back because we have to be behind the power lines. You can't build under the power lines. So we'll be kind of up next to where the a, a drug mart is. Um, this building will house, um, on one side, it will have eight practitioners that are four physicians and four nurse practitioners. Right now that's scheduled to be Dr. Leindecker, Dr. Pinion, Dr. Burnham, and Dr. Singham. They will have their nurse practitioners with them. Uh, that space is also designed to become a medical home. In other words, you've got enough practitioners there that you can probably put some social work help in there, occasionally have some nutrition counseling there. You can also have... Um, pharmacists go out. The waiting room will actually convert into a classroom so patients do not have to come to the hospital. Sometimes they don't want to come to the hospitals. It's, it's a little scarier than doing it in your doctor's office. Um, and that should be open in late summer. There is another entrance on the back side of this building. That is a one physician office. That's where Dr. Moore, the dermatologist, her office will be located at that site uh, when we get everybody moved. Uh, the finance pillar, if you look at the first set of numbers up there, you'll see that 70% of our business is outpatient. Further evidence that we are becoming much more outpatient facility than an inpatient facility. So in the first nine months, we built out $174 million. Of that, we actually got paid uh, a little over $80 million. We've received a little over $3 million from other things. Those typically are meaningful use dollars, uh, rent, and food that people purchase in the cafeteria. So. We brought in about 84 million in the first nine months. How we spent that 84 million, 44 million of it was salaries and benefits. 33 million were service supplies and other things that we use to take care of our patients. Five and a half million is insurance depreciation and interest. And that means that we have about a million and a half left over or 1.8% um, operating margin for the hospital. Now, the unfortunate thing about that is that we are all, we, we, you hear us talking about the budget and trying to find things, uh, extra dollars, because while we make $1.5 million in the hospital, we get about, we've gotten about 600000 out of task, but we've lost $6 million on the operations of physician practices. Now, while I know that sounds terribly horrible, we actually lose less on average than other hospitals in the United States. Um, this is one of those things where you're seeing a lot of costs going on. There are several reasons that this occurs. One of those reasons is as soon as a physician begins working on the hospital, our contracts that we uh, generated years ago were not um, contracts that had dollars in them for physician's offices. So now when we're trying to get paid more for physician offices, Anthem or United or somebody will say, sure, we'll give you an increase in the doctor's office. All you do is got to take a cut and pay in radiology, lab, and PT. Well, we still make more money on the hospital side, so in order to get the better reimbursement on the hospital side, we give up reimbursement on that side. We will continue to recruit, recruit and uh, hire physicians because uh, about 90% of the physicians coming out today want to be employed. They do not want to go into to their own setup. And as much as we all love Tuscarawas County, when we're competing with somebody in suburban anywhere, we typically have to pay that, that doctor a little bit more to come work in the rural environment. Um, now, fortunately, we've got a lot of doctors that have a relationship with Tuscarawas County, and that's a little easier to recruit them. But um, that is one of the things that happens is if somebody is looking in suburban Columbus for a job for $180,000, we may have to pay them $190,000 to recruit them here. So that is um, one of those things that, that happens in, in just part of this. We do recognize that the, the $6 million that we're losing, those doctors generate about $100 million of that revenue. So it's, it is a little bit of a trade-off. 
Uh, we do recognize that we need to improve this. Every hospital in the country recognizes they need to improve this, so we're working on that. Um, we did see a 23% increase in revenue this last, uh, so far this year from last year, and we've had a 9% reduction in expenses, so we have things going in the right direction there. Um, so please remember the big picture and remember that these doctors are helping us grow uh, the outpatient market. I'm going to turn it back over to Darwin to talk about the people pillar. And under the people pillar this quarter, we have our benefit changes, pending board approval. Uh, this will be the only change in our benefits package for 2016. Uh, I'm going to read the first bulletin and then let you read the rest, uh, but I will also discuss uh, the content. So for employees enrolled in either of our health care plans, a working spouse surcharge will be initiated in 2016. What this means is if you and your spouse are covered under the union, one of the union hospital health care plans and your spouse has access to a plan, a health care plan at their own organization, you have a choice to make. You can leave them on our health care plan and it will cost you an extra $100, a surcharge of $100 per month for two, beginning in 2016 or you can choose to have your spouse pick up their own plan at their organization. What this means is as a consumer of health care you're going to make a determination as to whether your money is best spent keeping your spouse on our health care plan or having them enroll in their own health care plan. As you see from the last bullet, the spousal surcharges are an industry standard for health care plans. 32% of current employers do have a spousal surcharge and the Kaiser Family Foundation study notes that over the next three years, 64% of employers will have this surcharge. Continuing with benefit changes, you'll notice our open enrollment for all benefit plans will begin November 24th, continue through December 11th. You have several options. If you do not change your current enrollments, you're happy with what your benefits are in 2015, those will continue to roll over to, through, through 2016. One requirement that we do have from federal regulations which states that if you have a flexible spending account, if you're enrolled in the 80-20 health care plan, you will be required to sign up for a uh, new deduction under that plan and again that's a federal requirement. If you have a health care savings account, then those deductions will continue at their 2015 levels unless you wish to change your contribution level for those plans. As you know, during the month of October, we have our annual employee service awards. We note here the uh, recipients of the 25-year award. Uh, we also had nine others who obtained the 25 years of service to Union Hospital. 30 years, you can see uh, those who achieved 30 years of service, not pictured was Julie Mason. And for 35 years, we had Gary Crowthers, Meg Kreitz, and Sandy Ickes. And 40 years, you will see Sue Liberatore, as well as Sylvia Mastellarini Ray and Sherry Strickmaker, who also achieved 40 years of service. And last and most importantly, Paul Miller, who achieved 45 years of service in our plant operations and maintenance department here at Union Hospital. In addition to those recipients, uh, Tom Patton, who works in our union, uh, worked in our Union Hospital outpatient uh, pharmacy retired this year after 43 years of service to Union Hospital. This is a picture of Tom at his uh, retirement reception and Tom loves us so much that he is already back as a volunteer at Union Hospital. So in summary, you will notice uh, that we like to summarize what we discussed today, our leapfrog grade of A as well as our stroke rating of gold plus. We had Paint Tusk Pink, which was a great success in the community. Our hospital acquired infections increased, and we need to continue to improve to meet our goals in that area. Our HCAPs improved. Unfortunately, our outpatient press Ganey scores did not improve. And our inpatient volumes continue to decline while our outpatient volumes increase, which continues with uh, where, we, where healthcare is moving today. Our new Behavioral Health Center is open in the 300 building here on the campus. Our third quarter financials show that we are losing money on a consolidated basis. 
and benefit changes are coming so please attend one of the sessions on benefits and we also celebrated many years of dedicated service to Union Hospital. Uh, under upcoming events we have the Auxiliary Christmas Tree Festival. This is the largest fundraising uh, event of the year for the Auxiliary. It will be held at Warther Carvings. It starts on November 2014th and goes through the 22nd of this year. And lastly, I want to remind everyone that we do have the Employee Engagement Survey uh, going on currently. You are required to uh, log in with your employee number. However, please know that it is a confidential survey and we do not receive uh, back any information in regards to individual survey results. So please consider participating in that survey. And lastly, please make sure that you complete your questionnaire and fill out a ticket to enter the drawing for a $100 gift card.